Welcome to Train Signal. This video covers the new features in Server 2003 Active Directory. Active Directory is probably the single most important feature to master in Windows 2000, and several important changes have taken place in Server 2003 that you need to fully understand. In this video, we'll take a quick peek at the new features in Server 2003 and see how these are effectively different than what we had in Windows 2000. Let's get started by taking a look at an overview of these new features in Active Directory. Now this list is a synopsis of the majority of the new features in Server 2003's Active Directory. Now with some of these, we're just going to take a quick look at them, discuss what they do. We won't be able to do too much more than that with them. They're just a little bit outside the scope of what we'll be doing today. Others on this list, though, we'll take a closer look at right now, and then some of these we're going to explore further on within this video series um, in some of the different lab videos. Okay, let's go take a look at our first two items up here on our list, and these are Rename the Domain and also Rename Domain Controllers. Both of these are new features in Server 2003, and in Windows 2000, what would happen if we wanted to rename the domain, this is a real, real big deal, because if you want to rename the domain in 2000, you'd really have to destroy your entire Active Directory structure. Okay, and bear in mind what I'm saying here. If you run DC Promo and demote your domain controller back down to just a standalone server, you're erasing all the user accounts, group accounts, any of the group policy objects that you had, so you're essentially starting that whole process over again. Okay, so in Server 2003, we can now rename the domain using two different tools here, rendom.exe, rename domain.exe, and gpfixup, group policy fixup. Both of these are downloadable from Microsoft's website. Um, this is a fairly complex process. It's not just, uh, you know, right-click, rename, that sort of thing. Okay, and then, you know, you got to make sure you do proper planning and go through the whole procedure. So, and this is something we're not going to take a look at right now. It's a little bit outside the scope of where we're at. Okay. One last thing on renaming the domain. Your forest has to be in what's called Windows, two, uh, Windows Server 2003 forest functional level. Okay, Windows Server 2003 forest functional level. And what that is, it's similar to in Windows 2000 where we had mixed mode and native mode. Okay, recall if you're in native mode, it allows you to take advantage of all the new features in Windows 2000. And the one requirement was that all your domain controllers must be running Windows 2000. Well, that's the same thing we have here, okay? With Windows Server 2003 Forest Functional Level, what that's saying is all the domain controllers, not only in the, in the domain, but in the forest, so that's if you have multiple domains in this forest, all of them have to be running Server 2003. Okay, if you, if you don't have, um, or if you have some domain controllers running 2000 or even still NT 4.0, you can't upgrade a forest functional level unless you want to cut off support to those domain controllers. Okay, long story short, if you want to be able to rename your domain, all of your domain controllers must be running server 2003, and you must have upgraded your forest functional level to server 2003. Okay, next, renaming domain controllers. A little bit easier process. Okay, with renaming domain controllers, um, we can go to basically where you'd normally change the computer name and make our changes here. So this is much more straightforward, and we'll take a look at this in a second. The one thing you do have to be careful of with this, though, is you have to make sure that you upgrade your domain, okay, your domain to server 2003 domain functional level. Okay, notice what I said here. In, in Windows 2000, we only had mixed mode and native mode. Okay, mixed mode and native mode. So you upgraded domains on a case-by-case -case basis. If you had two or three domains in your organization, one of them could be in mixed mode and one of them could be in native mode. In Surfer 2003, we actually have two different distinctive functional levels. There's domain functional levels and forest functional levels. Okay, so if you have um, all the domain controllers in one particular domain upgraded to server 2003, you can upgrade that domain to domain functional level of server 2003. Okay, and by doing so, that one domain will be able to take advantage of all the new features in server 2003 that relate to the domain. When you have all of your domain controllers in the entire forest upgraded to server 2003, that's when you can upgrade your forest functional level to server 2003. Okay, and then the, the advantage there, there are some certain features that are only available when your forest, not just your domain, but your forest, all of your domains, are upgraded to server 2003. 
Okay, and one of these is what we you know talked of up here, and that's the ability to rename the domain. Let's go take a look at how we do this process, what's involved, and we'll show you where the functional levels are at. Okay, and then we'll also take a look at how we would go through this process of renaming the domain controller. So what we're going to do here, we just have a, a simple environment. We're using remote desktop connection, just as we did in previous videos. And we're going to connect over to one of our servers here. And we'll start with 192.168.1.100, which is a server 2003 machine um, that's set up as a domain controller. OK, so once we get over here, we'll go into Active Directory. And the first thing we're going to look at is the functional levels, what we can do, how we can change these. Okay, and here's the interface we see in Server 2003, slightly different. Uh, all of these icons here, these are just simply here because I've opened up these tools in the recent past. So it's kind of like a little shortcut bar and you have control over, you know, whether or not you want these to appear here. So I'm just going to open it up the long cut way by going through all programs, administrative tools, and then going into Active Directory users and computers. Okay, once this opens up now, uh, I've got my domain name binandbrady.com. Okay, and remember, we're not renaming the binandbrady.com domain. We're going to be renaming the domain controllers that we see here. And currently in this domain, we have two different domain controllers, Server 1 and Server 2, just for simplicity uh, and for this example. So if we right-click up here on binandbrady.com, we see that we have a choice right here to raise domain functional level. And if I select this, Currently, right now, we're in Windows 2000 native mode, and then I have the ability to raise this up to Windows Server 2003 domain functional level. Okay, now if I did this, no big thing, you know, it's just going to click this and then click raise, you won't see a huge difference. Okay, so if we look right now, it tells us current domain functional level, this is where we're at, and make sure that you do realize after you raise the domain functional level, it cannot be reversed. Okay, so you got to make sure that you don't make a mistake here. Uh, if you have Windows 2000 domain controllers still in your environment, make sure you don't do this. Okay, so make doubly sure. So we're going to go ahead and uh, raise this up right now. So I'm just selecting Windows Server 2003, and then I click Raise. Okay, this change affects the entire domain. After you raise the domain functional, it cannot be reversed. Okay, so it says it was successful. It will take some time to replicate to each different domain controller in the domain. So I click OK, and like I said, there's not, nothing really big here. You don't see a, a whole heck of a lot of difference because um, there's not one. You will see some features that you couldn't do before um, that will now be enabled. And one of those features is the ability to rename our domain controllers. Okay, So we're going to take a look at a couple different pieces right now. First thing we'll do, we're going to go into Active Directory, Domains and Trust, just take a quick gander into here. We won't work with here long, but what I want to show you, this is just the area where we can uh, either raise domain functional level, or if you click on this interface up here, this is where you can raise the forest functional level. Okay, you see right now our current forest functional level is at Windows 2000. Um, I can raise it up to Windows Server 2003 if I want to. Okay, so we're not going to do this right now. Um, it's not necessary at this time, so we'll just leave this one alone. Okay. So we'll cancel this. And by the way, that brings up a good point. If you don't have a reason to raise the functional level up, either on the domain or the forest, you shouldn't do it. Okay, you never know. Something might happen. Some change might come across. Maybe you need to, uh, maybe you have an application or something that you want to put on Windows 2000 and it requires that it's a domain controller. Kind of a far-fetched example, but the point being, if you don't need to do it, don't do it. Okay, if you're not taking advantage of that particular feature um, that requires that, then, then don't raise your functional level up. Okay, so I'm going to close this, and what we're going to look at now is how we can actually rename this domain controller. Okay, so I'm going in here to my computer. Okay, and notice, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this interface in Server 2003 or not, but it's similar to how XP is set up. Um, everything's kind of pinned within here. If you're not comfortable with this, it's you know, simple enough to right-click, Properties. We can go back to our classic Start menu here, Okay, and I've got everything right here on my desktop. So no big deal there either. So what we're going to do is right-click my computer, go to Properties. Okay, then we see Computer Name here. And then once I click Change, this tells me right here, domain controllers cannot be moved from one domain to another. They must first be demoted. Renaming this domain controller may cause it to become temporarily unavailable. 
So if I click OK here now, I see that the computer name is Server1, and I do have the ability to rename this uh, computer. In Windows 2000, this was actually grayed out. You wouldn't see this. You wouldn't be able to do anything with it um, unless you demoted your domain controller back down to a standalone machine. Okay, so I can change this if I wanted to. Um, I'm not going to. I don't want to cause any naming issues at this point right now when we're just doing demonstrations. But the only thing you need to do is just simply change the number. So if I wanted this to be uh, Server 4, I could just change it to Server 4, click OK a couple times, and reboot your machine. So it's very simple. The one thing I will caution you on, however, we've tested this out and you can come in here and actually change the computer name of this machine without being in um, Server 2003 domain functional level. You can do it. It's going to cause errors. Okay, All sorts of stuff show up in your event viewer, so I do not recommend that you do that. You're going to have all sorts of name resolution issues and that's not what you want with your domain controller. Okay, Let me repeat that real quick. Um, Remember a second ago in, in Active Directory, I raised the domain functional level up here. Okay, We did that um, uh, prior to going into renaming this domain controller. Well, if you just install a Server 2003 machine from scratch, you don't have to raise the functional level up before you change the domain name, uh, the domain controller name. I can actually come in here, click Change, click OK, change this name, click OK, Reboot, Everything seems like it works perfectly. No error mess messages are generated right away. However, if you go look in Event Viewer, you'll see quite a few different error messages, and your different client machines are going to start running into different inaccessibility problems. So, in sum, make sure that you are in uh, Server 2003 domain functional level before you change the computer name. Okay, the next thing we're going to take a look at here in our list is the ability to do a couple things. Modify common properties for multiple users at one time, and then also drag and drop Active Directory objects within the Active Directory Users and Computers tool. Okay, so let's focus on these two tasks. The ability to modify common properties for multiple users, okay, and also to drag and drop Active Directory objects within this tool. So we're going to go right back over again to our domain controller here, Server 1. Okay, what we're going to do here, uh, go inside Active Directory, and we've created a little structure here, an organizational unit structure, just to kind of test the waters out here and show you what we're talking about. And if you open up one of these OUs, one of these OUs here, I think we've got some people. There we go, finally found them. Uh, we've got three users created within the marketing OU, which is a sub OU of San Francisco. If I want to modify the properties of these three users at once, I can select one, hold down shift, okay, I'm holding down the shift key right now, and select the other one, and it selects all three of these users. I can then right click, go down to properties, okay, and it opens up a common dialog box here. It tells us that multiple users are selected, and we can change the properties for a lot of users at one time, and this, this is a huge time saver. Uh, maybe the phone number changed for all of them, maybe the fax number changed, whatever it might be. Okay, we also can come in here, we can change the UPN, which we'll talk a little bit more about in uh, our definitions video next. Uh, log on hours, okay, any properties that can be commonly changed, you know, we can change here on multiple users at one time. Now, when I say properties that can be commonly changed, well, we wouldn't be renaming a user account all to the same user account. So that's not one property that's going to show up here. Um, so if we look down through here, we see some of the different things we can do. We can change the, the logon script path, home folder, profile path. We can choose what organization they're under. So not a huge deal, but it is a time saver, and it's helpful to know this. Another thing you can do with this, instead of selecting all the users, you can use the control key to intermittently select users. So I want to select Bob Brown and Tyler Taylor here. So I hold down control, and I can select those two particular users. Now, of course, if you have 100 users sitting here, the same thing applies. Just hold down control and you know hunt and pack whichever users you want to actually select. Okay, and same thing happens. Right click, properties, and we see we have the exact same thing, the multiple users selected uh, dialog box here. Now, another thing we can do is drag and drop users into different areas. Let's say that Jill Jones actually is not part of marketing, but she's part of the sales team. I can just pick up Jill Jones drop her down and place her into the sales OU. So it's very, very simple and I think you'd almost expect this from a Windows interface. 
However, in Windows 2000, that wasn't possible. What you'd have to do is right-click on the user, okay, go down to Move, and then select that particular OU that you wanted to place them in. Okay, so that's not a huge deal, but it sure is a heck of a lot easier to be able to drag and drop users. Okay, I can uh, combine some things here. If I want, I can use the Control or the Shift key once again, and I can drag and drop both these users. Okay, so this drag and drop functionality makes things a heck of a lot easier as well, and this is just another new feature that's available in Server 2003. Let's go back over here to our list one more time. And the next new feature we'll show is the ability to disable the default administrator account. Okay, now let's first focus on why you would want to do this. Now keep in mind, when you first install Windows 2000 or Server 2003, a default administrator account is created, okay, and the name is administrator. Now in 2000, we could rename this account to anything we really want to. Okay, and that's good security practice to rename your default administrator account. This still often isn't good enough though. Sometimes people will leave this without renaming it, but even if you do rename it, there are some uh, security books that will recommend that you actually don't use this account whatsoever. Use a really, really strong password with it because this account can still be cracked into. Um, hackers can still figure out which one is the default administrator account. Okay, this has an advantage because this default administrator account, it cannot be disabled in Windows 2000. Well, this is different in Windows Server 2003. In Server 2003 now, we have the ability to disable this account, which will make your servers much more secure. Let's go take a look at this. Okay, so this user account right now is just in the default location here under Users, and we see here we have the default administrator account, and we know this we know that this is the default because it says built-in account for administering the computer or domain. Okay, so, and I tell you this, you know, you might say, of course, that's the administrator account. It says so. Well, you may walk up to your computer. Maybe you've renamed it at some point. Okay, so let's just say that I renamed my administrator account as such. Okay, and I'm not able to do this right now because this is how we're logged in. But if we do this, what will happen Let's just go ahead and say yes here, and then we'll come back to that. Just to give you an example of what I'm talking about. Okay, now we've got our default administrator account renamed to something different. Okay, what I was telling you before, yeah, this is more secure than leaving the default administrator name. But even more secure would be to disable this account and use a different administrator account altogether. Now, make sure that you create another administrator account first. If I just go ahead and right-click and then disable this account, I'm effectively locking my administrator account out, and I don't want to do that. So what I can do here is just create a new user account. We'll go ahead and step through this. Okay, and we'll just use, uh, oh, let's just call him Spider-Man, lack of a better word here. Okay, so we'll use Spider-Man as our administrator account. Click Next. We'll have to put in a password here to meet our security requirements. Okay, so I've created this user account, and the next thing I need to do then is add this user account to the uh, domain administrators and then the local administrators. So I'm going to go over here to member of and then click add and put it inside the domain admins. Okay, and that's actually enough right there, just putting it in the domain admins. Okay, well now I can use this account, so there's no issues here. I can just use the Spider-Man user account to log on and log off of the system. Okay, now, you know, I can feel more comfortable with disabling this account. Okay, so it tells us right here, this, this account has been disabled. And keep in mind, this is how we're logged on here right now. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if a second here we're not able to open some stuff. We're going to be effectively uh, locked out. Let's see if we can open this tool right back up right now. Okay, we're still able to get inside here. If we were to log off this, and within minutes, by the way, you won't be able to access different tools here. That's what happens when you disable the account. If I log off this system, however, and then attempt to log back on again, let's see what happens. Okay, system cannot log you on. Make sure username and domain are correct. So this username that we were trying to use before just doesn't work. And we should be able to use our new username. 
Okay, and you see now we're able to log on to the system. And because it is a new user account, you'll see a different profile generated here. Okay, when I say different profile, that means um, the, the desktop background is going to be different. It's going to be as if we just logged onto the server for the first time, like you just got done installing it. Okay, so that gives you a feel then for what's going on. Let's go back over here then and take a look at our next new feature in Server 2003. And that new feature is what is known as Universal Group Membership Caching. Okay, and kind of a long word here, but what it's actually done for is to cut down on our need for global catalog servers. And in our next video, where we actually go through some terms and define these terms, learn more about them, we'll spend some time focusing on what exactly a global catalog server is. For right now, though, we'll just take a brief look at what the global catalog servers are, just to better explain what universal group membership caching is all about. Now, we're going to use this diagram to better explain this. Okay, so Global Catalog Server, just a brief overview. Um, global Catalog Servers serve a couple functions. Okay, the Global Catalog Server is going to help us out with what's called universal groups. And anytime a user logs on to the network, you have to check with the Global Catalog Server um, to obtain your universal group memberships. So in this environment right here, every time somebody logs on to either San Francisco or North Carolina, they're going to have to go to a Global Catalog Server before they can log on. Okay, and by the way, this environment, we've got a domain environment. It's got two different sites. We have a San Francisco location and a North Carolina location. Domain controllers in both of these different remote locations. And you see that it's connected by a 128 kilobit per second link. Now, right now we have global catalog servers in both areas. Okay, and this is the recommend, uh, recommended setup is to have a global catalog server in each different site. And as I said, we're going to go in more depth on this here uh, in our next video, but just for right now, just a quick overview. Now, the problem with having global catalog servers in each site, though, is there is replication traffic between global catalog servers. So these global catalog servers will be exchanging information over this link. Now, this can call bandwidth, cause bandwidth issues, so this is something we might want to eliminate. If, however, we get rid of the global catalog server, we make this machine not a global catalog server any longer. The next issue then is users within this North Carolina remote site here, they're going to have to traverse this 128 kilobit per second link in order to contact a global catalog server. Okay, so neither solution here is really working out how we want it to. Well, in server 2003, we have that new feature we were talking about, universal group membership caching. And what that would do, instead of having this machine as a global catalog server, so erase this global catalog server here, okay, this machine we can enable universal group membership caching on this machine, okay, and then what will happen here, it's actually done within the site. It's not done specifically on one domain controller, and we'll show that here in a second. But once you've done that, these domain controllers will cache this information from the global catalog server. So they'll contact it. Um, the first time somebody attempts to log on, that information will be obtained from the global catalog server. But once a user logs on from North Carolina, that information will be pulled from the global catalog server and then stored here Okay, we're on this machine where we've got that uh, universal group membership caching enabled. Okay, so the advantage... Now we don't have to have a global catalog server. It's going to save us from the replication traffic that would you know, normally occur between two global catalog servers. And our users are still able to log on. Okay, Because without a global catalog server present, our users can't log on. Okay, Let's go take a look at this right now just to show you really where this is located. And we'll connect back over to our server 2003 machine. Okay, we're going to have to log on with our Spider-Man user account. I think what we'll do as long as we're over here, let's enable that administrator account once again so we can use that. We've got stuff configured under there, so I'm going to go ahead and go back in first to Active Directory Users and Computers. Okay, and the purpose of doing this, once again, we're just going to enable that administrator account. Okay, where are we at here? Scott S. Okay, and we see that it's disabled right here. So I right-click, enable account, and now it tells us it has been enabled. So we won't log off and log back on. It's no big deal. We'll continue to do our work as long as we're logged on here as Spider-Man. Now the next tool we need to look at is Active Directory Sites and Services. And this is where we actually configure global catalog servers, which we'll show in the next video. 
And this is also where we can configure the universal group membership caching. Okay, to do that, first notice that we do have two different sites, North Carolina and San Francisco, and this is done so it matches up to our diagram that we showed before, North Carolina and San Francisco. Okay, so if we look over here once again, we also see that if we pop this open here, we have server 2 located in North Carolina, and we have server 1 located in San Francisco. Okay, and now what these represent then are the different sites. And we're not going to go into sites right now and explain the true purpose of sites. It's really beyond the scope of what we're talking about. Okay, but if we do, do want to set that information we were talking about before, the universal group membership caching, we can go in here to NTDS Site Settings, go to Properties, and you see right here we have a checkbox, Enable Universal Group Membership Caching. Okay, and it tells us right here, if I enable this, keep in mind it is being accomplished and done on the site, not on a particular server. And why that's important is because you may have 2, 4, 6, 10, 20, however many domain controllers located within each of these different sites. Okay, so we're not really selecting. So if I select this here, simple as that, I can click OK now, and Universal Group Membership and Caching has been enabled. Okay, so just a brief tidbit of information just to show you how that is done. We'll leave it set up that way. It's not going to hurt anything. Okay, our next new feature in Server 2003 is down here number seven, Cross Forest Trusts. Okay, Cross Forest Trust. What we're dealing with here first with trust relationships. Uh, trust relationships are what go on between two different domains Okay, and trusts are necessary uh, if you have two different domains, whether it's in the same forest or different forest, a trust relationship allows resources to be shared between those two different domains. Okay, without a trust relationship there, you can't use the users and groups that you've created in either one of those domains. Let's take a look at what we're talking about here when we say cross forest trusts. Okay, what we'll start off with first here is let's just say that we have company one so ignore everything you see over here company two on these lines and stuff okay and what we have we have company one and it's benandbrady.com and here's the forest benandbrady.com here's the very first domain here's the domain controller and we added two additional domains we have west.benandbrady.com and east.benandbrady.com okay no big deal here as far as the naming is concerned what we're worried about though are the trust relationships that that take place when you set up a child domain here, automatically trust relationships are two-way back and forth. Okay, so this domain trusts this domain, and the West domain then will trust the benandbrady.com domain. And once again, what that means here, well, I'm going to have file servers here and file servers here, for example, and I can set up permissions that will allow users from either one of these domains to access resources in the other domain. And the same thing occurs over on this side. These two domains trust each other, okay, and we'll be able to share resources back and forth. Furthermore, we have transitive trusts, okay? These are two-way transitive trusts. And when we say transitive, essentially what we're talking about here is, well, since Ben and Brady trust West and Ben and Brady trust East, then as far as we're concerned, East and West, you know, they trust each other. And that's exactly what happens. The East and West domain automatically have trust relationships two-way back and forth set up between them. Okay, so automatically when we install Windows 2000 or Server 2003 for that matter, we have trust relationships between all of the domains in the forest. Now here's where the forest trust comes in, the new feature in Server 2003. And this takes place when Company 1 acquires Company 2. Okay, so these companies were not related, um, completely different IT infrastructures. Company 2 built their own Windows 2000 or Server 2003 in this case uh, for a structure. Okay, so BenandBrady.com purchased this WiredBrainCoffee.com domain here. And just like the Ben and Brady Forest, they also have their own three domains on this side. Okay, and these domains all trust each other as well, just as these ones did. Okay, now in Windows 2000, if I wanted to merge these two companies together and, you know, essentially share these IT infrastructures so some user down here in West Ben and Brady could access resources over here in East, this should say, this don't be confused by this, this should actually be West.WiredBrainCoffee and this should be East.WiredBrainCoffee, so this is a misprint down here. 
But users here should be able to access resources over here in this domain, okay, a totally different company. To get that done, however, we have to set up manual trust relationships between all these different domains. It's not good enough just to say company one trust company two. That will only allow a trust relationship to take place between these two domains. Okay, if we wanted this domain to trust this domain or this one, we'd manually have to set this up. We'd literally have to set up each different trust relationship between these two different companies. So here we'd have to have this domain trust this domain, and we'd have to have this domain trust this domain. So tedious, a lot of work, more moving parts, more to break down. In Server 2003, what we can do instead is create what's called a forest trust. Okay, and the one thing we have to have to do this is Server 2003 domain controllers. Okay, because in order to do this, we do have to boost our forest functional level up to Server 2003 before we can accomplish this. Okay, so this doesn't just occur without having that forest functional level boosted up. Server 2003 domain controllers everywhere. Now, what will happen is when I set up a forest trust, we don't have to worry about all those other trusts because when we set the trust up between benandbrady.com and wiredbraincoffee.com, all the domains underneath over here, all the domains underneath over here, all these domains now trust each other. Okay, without us having to do anything else, and that's the default. You can uh, set this differently. You can change this around if you don't want it to, you know, act that way. For security purposes, you do have the ability to change that. Okay, but the default, and this is typically how most companies will want it set up, is to have all these domains trusting each other, and that's what you get with a forest trust. Okay, our last point here, new feature in Server 2003. Now we got a couple more. Group Policy Management Council. Okay, and we got a whole video on the Group Policy Management Council, but you know, we'll save that. This is a real cool tool. It makes group policy much, much easier to not only plan, but also to get resultant sets of policies. So what you'll see here is you got a much nicer way of managing group policies and then finding out exactly what policies are set on a particular you know, organizational unit or domain, what settings are set within a policy. Okay, so we'll take a closer look at this within one of our later videos. Okay, and then lastly, we have replication enhancements. And this isn't something we can really show, but it's more efficient. Okay, this is done in a more secure manner, and this takes place on both domain controllers and global catalog servers. Okay, that wraps up then our Active Directory new features in Server 2003 video. We'll see you back here real soon when we get into some terms and definitions revolving around Active Directory in Windows 2000 and Server 2003.